As the sun was setting on the 15th of September in the year 1186 CE, when the sun, moon, and five visible planets were conjunct in the astrological sign of Libra, Shahab al-Din al-Suhavadi, the Sheikh al-Ishraq, the master of illumination, also known as al Maktul, the murdered master, having been executed at the command of none other than Saladin, completed his composition of his magnum opus, the Hikmat al-Ishraq, the philosophy or wisdom of illumination. Sudhavadi's philosophy combined the rational and discursive methods of the peripatetics, the followers of Aristotle, with that of the intuitive or mystical insight of the Sufis, dalk, literally meaning tasting and equivalent to our use of the word gnosis, referring to a direct and unmediated apprehension of reality, which would serve as the epistemological foundation of his science of lights a system of spiritual, practical, and philosophical speculation that would progressively lead the soul to illumination through an ascent into the world of pure and corporeal light. As such, Suavardi's philosophy is a philosophy of light and illumination, and in this video we'll explore his mature philosophy as it is represented in his work, The Philosophy of Illumination, the Hikmat al-Ishraq, exploring its ontological, epistemological, and soteriological foundations. I am extremely intrigued by Suavardi and his conception of philosophy as combining the intuitive insight of the mystic with the rigorous argumentative methods of the philosopher. And I think this has something to offer us in our own age, just as it did in Suhavardi's, where philosophy had become excessively rationalistic at the expense of transformative insight and experience. So it's my aim with this video, as well as with this channel more generally, to help articulate a conception of philosophy which facilitates navigation of the intuitive and often difficult to articulate currents of inner transformative experience. So if you're interested in this project, subscribe to the channel and make sure to like the video, and we'll continue to explore these topics in coming videos. Suhavardi conceived of his philosophical and spiritual project as reviving the wisdom of the ancients, of the sages of ancient Egypt and Greece, and those of ancient Persia. It was to such cultures that Suhavardi believed God originally revealed this wisdom in the form of direct intuitive gnosis. In the West, this wisdom was first directly revealed to Hermes in Egypt, and then passed on to Agathodaimon and Asclepius. From there, passing into the Greek world to Empedocles, then down to Pythagoras, and eventually to Plato. You'll note here that this conception of the history of philosophy is not exactly factual. We'll have more to say about this in just a bit. Notably, Aristotle's left off this list. Suavardi viewed the excessive rationalism of Aristotle, especially of those who carried on the Aristotelian project, the Peripatetics, as causing this transmission of wisdom to die out. Suhavadi viewed it as his role to revive it by developing, or rather reintroducing, the science of mystic light to the world. It was precisely such a science that was revealed to the ancients, according to Suhavadi, and he saw it as his duty to rekindle it. Shams al-Din Shadazuri, the early commentator on Sudhavadi, whose commentaries set the agenda for later interpretations of Sudhavadi's works, writes that the ancients were those who were capable of beholding directly, quote, spiritual and incorporeal entities, independently of thinking and the techniques of syllogism and essential definition, but rather access such realities through, quote, successive differing rays of light, stealing the soul from the body so that they can be seen, suspended, and incorporeal. The ancients are those who were capable of abstracting away from their bodies and perceiving a world of pure, incorporeal, and intelligible light. Sudhavardi, in describing his own experience of this reality, and thereby rightfully placing himself within this chain of transmission, writes, Whoso questions the truth of this, whoever is unconvinced by the proof, let him engage in mystical disciplines and service to those visionaries, that perchance he will, as one dazzled by the thunderbolt, see the light blazing in the kingdom of power, and will witness the heavenly essences and lights that Hermes and Plato beheld. He will see the spiritual luminaries, the wellsprings of kingly splendor and wisdom that Zoroaster told of, and that which the good and blessed king Kai Kusuru unexpectedly beheld in a flash. All the sages of Persia were agreed thereon. 
Only those who attain to such a station of intuitive insight are rightfully considered divine philosophers, and Sulavadi sees himself as just such a philosopher. For Sulavadi, God first revealed this wisdom to Hermes, who he refers to as the father of philosophers, and who for Sulavadi, as well as other Muslim and medieval thinkers, saw as identical to the prophet Idris, the Hebrew Enoch. This gives us a little taste of the perennialism embedded in the philosophy of illumination. From Hermes, this wisdom divides into two streams, one going to the west through Egypt and Greece, the other going to the east to Persia. From Greece and Persia, the transmission then reaches Islamic civilization in the figure of Sudhavadi himself. However, it's important to note here the tremendous influence that Sufism has over Sudhavadi. In his visionary dream encounter with Aristotle, for instance, Sudhavadi asks which of the Islamic philosophers had reached this station of direct knowledge. It's not Ibn Sina that is given as the answer, but rather the Sufis, al bistami and Al-Tustadi, and their like. It's the Sufis that Sudhavadi holds as possessing the divine philosophy, Al-Ghazali and Al-Halaj, for instance, not Ibn Sina and the Peripatetics. Of course, it would be a mistake to underestimate the massive influence that Ibn Sina has on Sulavadi, but the influence is one that Sulavadi is consciously attempting to move beyond, a foil for his own illuminationist philosophy, which he views as the focal point of the reunification of the wisdom traditions of the East and the West. It is really no wonder, then, that Sulavadi garnered the ire of the ruling elite. He was highly charismatic and eloquent, easily overcoming opponents in debate, and was also not shy of exposing esoteric doctrine. This already earned him the disdain of the orthodox clergy and scholars, but he had also attracted the fond attention of Saladin's son, Malak Sahir, who Saladin had appointed ruler of Aleppo in 1183, and who had become one of Sudhavadi's devout disciples. Given Sudhavadi's unorthodox views, as well as his commitment to the idea of a divine philosopher king, it's not hard to see how the ruling elite found this relationship worrying. On top of this, Shadazuri notes that his companions and disciples had called him a prophet of God, and it's quite possible that Sudhavadi claimed the status of prophet for himself. In view of where he places himself in his own lineage as the spiritual heir of both the wisdom traditions of East and West, he is all but implying that he has achieved the same status as Hermes. All of this would be enough for Saladin to order his execution in 1191, cutting the Sheikh's life short at roughly the young age of 38. And as I mentioned before, it would be prudent to bear in mind here that Sudhavadi's conception of the history of philosophy is colored by the fragmentary nature of the information that he and Islamic philosophers and historians had access to. The Hermeticism he had access to, for instance, was the Hermeticism which had been preserved in the northern Mesopotamian city of Haran by the Sabians, who considered Hermes their prophet. Misattributions and pseudepigrapha also abounded. A notable influence on Islamic thought generally was the infamous theology of Aristotle, which was really a paraphrase of Plotinus' Enneads, interspersed with Aristotelian ideas and nomenclature. Nonetheless, what is important for us is how Sudhavadi saw his own philosophical and spiritual project. Philosophy for Sudhavadi is to be divided into two kinds, discursive and intuitive. While discursive philosophy is based upon reasoning and rational speculation, intuitive philosophy deals with a direct perception of the world of pure and material light, the noetic realm, to use platonic terminology, and whose insights, going beyond those of the discursive intellect, must be communicated in image and symbol to the initiates of such knowledge. In fact, it is through such an intuitive faculty Sudhavadi informs us that the hikmat was itself composed, attaining it through intuition in his retreats and visions. He writes, I did not first arrive at it through cogitation. Rather, it was acquired through something else. Subsequently, I sought proof for it, so that should I cease contemplating the proof, nothing would make me fall into doubt. Mystical experience for Sudhavadi is the raw data upon which discursive philosophy ought to be built. Discursive philosophy is an empty shell without it. Rational arguments and theoretical speculations are fruitless in the absence of this grounding in an intuitive and direct apprehension of reality. 
the Hikmat al-Ishraq is itself structured upon this basis, with the first half being given over to the refutations of the peripatetics in the peripatetic manner, that is through syllogistic reasoning and rational critique, while the second half deals with the Ishraqi doctrines specifically, being expressed through the symbolism of light and darkness, of an angelology and a mystic hierarchy of immaterial and noetic lights. The best philosopher, according to Sudhavardi, is the one who is a master of both discursive and intuitive philosophy. Sudhavardi writes, Should it happen that in some period there be a philosopher proficient in both intuitive philosophy and discursive philosophy, he will be the ruler by right and the vicegerent of God. And of course, Sudhavardi considers himself to be just such a philosopher, following in a line of ancient sages and reviving their wisdom for his own age, an age that has been overly infatuated with, as Shahrazuri puts it, speculation and rules, with refutations and rebuttals, questions and answers, and other such matters that keep them from acquiring intuitive philosophy. Sudhavardi writes, The best student is the student of both intuitive philosophy and discursive philosophy. Next is the student of intuitive philosophy, and then the student of discursive philosophy. In fact, the Hikmat al-Ishraq won't even be comprehensible to those who have not experienced some intimation of the divine lights that it puts forth. He writes, This book of ours is for the student of both intuitive philosophy and discursive philosophy. There is nothing in it for the discursive philosopher not given to and not in search of intuitive philosophy. We only discuss this book and its symbols with the one who has mastered intuitive philosophy or who seeks it. The reader of this book must have reached at least the stage in which the divine light has descended upon him, not just once, but regularly. No one else will find any profit in it. Illumination draws the reader to the text, and the text draws the reader to it through illumination. All reality is light, expressed in various degrees of intensity, a relationship of light upon light. As we have seen, Suravardi makes a distinction between discursive and intuitive philosophy. The divine philosopher of the highest rank being the one who can unite the two together. The first half of the philosophy of illumination represents Sudhavadi's discursive project, which is largely aimed at undermining core peripatetic doctrines. The two doctrines Sudhavadi aims to undermine that we'll be discussing in this video are first, the doctrine that essence is distinct from existence, and second, that essential definition can give us certain knowledge. We'll begin by discussing the essence-existence distinction first, and in part three, we'll cover the doctrine of essential definition. The idea that existence is distinct from essence requires us to draw a distinction between the existence of a thing, wujud, whether or not it is, and on the other hand, the nature of a thing, mahia, its essence or quiddity. The distinction between essence and existence can be traced back to the works of Aristotle where it first is raised. Traces of the distinction likely also appear in Plotinus' Enneads, but it's in the Islamic world, in the figure of Ibn Sina in particular, that the distinction takes on major theological and metaphysical import, and from here also makes its way into medieval scholasticism. The general idea is that for any object of perception or intellection, we can ask two questions about it. First, is it? That is, does it exist? This is a question about wujud, the thing's existence. Second, what is it? What is its essence? What distinguishes it from all other things? This is a question about mahia, or essence. As a theological notion, the essence-existence distinction gives rise to the idea that, quote, everything in the universe is poor in the sense of not possessing any wujud, or existence, of its own. It is the necessary being alone which bestows wujud upon the mahiyat, the essences, and brings them from the darkness of non-existence into the light of wujud, covering them with the robe of necessity, while in themselves they remain forever in the nakedness of contingency. So, in other words, God creates reality by bestowing upon things a portion of his own existence, making existence in some sense accidental, such that existing things exist only insofar as their existence is given to them by the transcendent necessary being. 
Existing things are thus contingent. Their being is, in some sense, accidental. A particular thing in its distinct individuality can only come to be if existence is added to its essence from the outside. This is the idea motivating Ibn Sina's doctrine of radical contingency and, in fact, according to Nasser, becomes the key for understanding the nature of reality. While Al-Farabi is the first of the Islamic thinkers in which the distinction appears, it was Ibn Sina's articulation of the problem that seriously raised the issue that essences must have a cause outside of themselves that brings them into being. One of the central arguments that enables Ibn Sina to formulate this distinction between essence and existence is the doubt argument, which purports to show that essence is in fact distinct from existence. The argument goes as follows. Premise 1. If you can conceive of the essence of a thing, so for example a triangle, without knowing whether or not that thing exists, then the essence of that thing must be distinct from its existence. Second premise, you can conceive of a thing, for example a triangle, without knowing whether or not it exists as a particular concrete individual. Therefore, knowledge of a thing's essence is distinct from knowledge of its existence. So the argument seems to suggest that essence and existence are distinct. The question though is in what sense are they distinct? Is this a real distinction? That is a distinction about the way in which things are at the level of reality? Or is it a conceptual distinction? A distinction that operates at the level of thought alone as a kind of necessary logical division that facilitates intelligibility. If the former is the case, then we have a metaphysical picture like the one I was describing just a moment ago, where God breathes existence into the essences, individuating them as concrete entities in the world. And if the latter is the case, then essence and existence are only different in thought. In reality, they are one and the same. It's unclear how Ibn Sina himself interpreted this argument. Nonetheless, what's important for us is how other thinkers thought about this issue after Ibn Sina. As we'll see, Suavardi lands squarely in the conceptualist camp, denying that the essence-existence distinction is a real one. The distinction operates only at the level of concepts, but Suavardi thinks that reality is fundamentally non-conceptual, or rather supra-conceptual, because the reality that lies behind our application of concepts is far brighter and more luminous than any purely conceptual insight we might have. Reality for Suravardi is light, a reality that no concept or proposition could adequately describe or communicate other than an experience of the reality of light itself. This is because for Suravardi, existence is not something. It's not something. In fact, that can be defined at all. If existence were a thing, it would have to have an essence. But if that were the case, then we'd end up right back where we were, asking whether that essence has an existence. If it does have an existence, then it must have an essence, and so on and so forth. That is, we run into an infinite regress. So the concept existence is purely mental for Sudhavardi. We apply it in our thought and talk about the world, but there's nothing in the world to which it applies as a thing. The idea of a general or universal existence is a concept within the mind that doesn't exist as a concrete individual. A further argument Suavardi gives for the purely intellectual status of the distinction is that if existence were something in the world, it would have to be either a substance or an accident. And if it were a substance, then it would have to attach or adhere to some other substance, making it a property or an accident. But if it's a property, it must be present in the substance. And if it's present, then this presence must itself exist. And now we can ask of the existence of this presence, is its existence a substance or an accident? And we are right back to where we started and the infinite regress sets in. Given these lines of reasoning, Suravadi is read by later Ishraqi thinkers as having asserted the doctrine of the ontological primacy of essence that essence is more fundamental than existence. In grasping a thing, we grasp its essence, which is the thing's reality in concrete terms. There's definitely textual evidence to support this reading, but that view is hard to square with the fact that Sudavardi thinks that the distinction as a whole is unreal, that it's a conceptual artifice, so to speak, and that reality runs beyond any application of concepts we might have of it. 
Whatever the correct interpretation here is, it is clear that Sudhavati's argument against a real essence existence distinction paves the way for him to establish the most basic feature of the Ishraqi doctrine, that reality fundamentally is light, a reality whose manifestation occurs with varying degrees of intensity ranging from pure immaterial light to darkness and shadow. Reality is constituted by a gradation of light that spans a vast hierarchy, stretching from the world of immaterial pure light to the material world of matter which is shadow and darkness. And while this at first does appear to be a kind of Manichaean dualism of light versus darkness, it's important to remember that for Sudhavardi, darkness is not substantial. It has no independent reality. It is rather the shadow that is cast from the light, a privation of the ultimate reality. All things then can be considered from the perspective of whether they are light or darkness. And for Sudhavarti, there is nothing more evident in the universe than light itself. It is self-evident and axiomatic. Whoever encounters light knows it immediately and directly. The idea is that it would be absurd to have to shine a light upon a light in order to see the light because the light in its very nature is self-luminous. And the light that Sudhavarti is speaking of is immaterial pure light, of which physical light is only a reflection. The light of the world of pure light is experienced by the mystic while absorbed in trance or vision, while absorbed and annihilated in God. Light is known through a direct experience of it, not through a mental representation or the application of concepts, but directly and intuitively through a kind of knowledge that Sudhavarti refers to as knowledge by presence. Light is the most basic reality, and as such, everything must be defined in terms of it. Sudhavardi develops a technical vocabulary to discuss the different degrees and intensity of light and shadow. Light can be analyzed along the following dimensions. First, whether it is light or darkness, and second, whether it is dependent or independent. That which is light and not dependent upon anything else is incorporeal or pure light. This is light of itself and in itself. Light that subsists by itself and which apprehends or is conscious of its own essence and therefore is evident to itself. It doesn't require anything other than itself to be what it is and to know that it is. Sudhavardi writes, the incorporeal pure light is light in itself. Therefore, everything that is light in itself is incorporeal pure light. Of this class of lights are the light of lights itself, the necessary being. Also, incorporeal lights, which are emanations of the light of lights. These are archangels, angels, platonic archetypes, the forms, and human souls. That which is light but is dependent upon another is known as accidental light. These are luminous accidents. This is light of itself but in another, meaning that it is light which apprehends its own essence but depends on something else to subsist within. Here we have, for instance, the light which is reflected in the stars at night, which depends upon a physical body for its existence. Likewise, the physical light that is reflected through a prism is dependent upon the prism for its manifestation. Luminous accidents also occur, though, amongst the incorporeal lights, as we'll see in just a bit through the interaction of their rays and aspects. Darkness, on the other hand, is simply the absence of light. Sudhavardi writes, Darkness is simply an expression for the lack of light, nothing more. And further, if the world were posited to be a vacuum or a sphere with no light in it, it would be dark. Everything that is neither a light nor illumined is dark. Of darkness, there are two kinds. First, there's corporeal or pure darkness. Those things whose nature is darkness in itself. Things that are essentially an absence of light. Of this type of darkness are physical bodies, which Sudhavati refers to as barriers or dusky substances. Then there is darkness that is dependent upon another. This is accidental darkness or dark accidents. Darkness that depends on something other than itself and subsists by something other than itself. Of this type of darkness are the shapes of physical objects, for instance. Their magnitude, how big or small they are their qualitative aspects, their color, their taste, their smell, etc. Dark accidents not only occur amongst dusky substances, 
but also in the incorporeal pure lights themselves and will in fact be the aspect of the immaterial lights that give rise to the corporeal universe. Finally, there is a special class of entities that are neither light nor darkness in themselves, but are somewhere in between the incorporeal and the corporeal. These are the autonomous images of the Alam al-Mithal, the mundus imaginalis that serves as a medium by which the incorporeal world of lights communicates and interacts with the corporeal world of shadow and darkness, and is the domain of magic, prophecy, and visionary ascent. We'll talk about this a bit later. This gradation of light and darkness, lights shining from their own luminous intensities or dusky substances and barriers obscuring the light with their darkness, only makes sense within Sudavadi's emanationist cosmology, which we'll explore further now. As we've seen, reality is constituted by gradations of intensity of light that stretch from the highest point in the world of immaterial light to the lowest in the world of corporeal darkness and shadow. At the top of the hierarchy in the incorporeal world of pure light is the light of lights, the necessary being, that is the source of all light and which is dependent upon nothing other than itself and which gives its light to all subsequent beings in the emanatory hierarchy. From within the light of lights occurs a ray, an act of illumination that overflows into the first incorporeal light, the first emanation, what Sudhavarti refers to as the proximate light, a light that Sudhavarti associates with Bhaman, the first of the Zoroastrian archangels. To be clear, there is no definitive separation between the light of lights and the proximate light. Rather, we should think of the relation between them as like the relation between the sun and one of its rays. The ray is not something other than the sun. It is the sun emanating out from itself. Furthermore, we shouldn't conceive of a ray as a line of energy moving from a light to the thing illumined, even though I've used the line here in the diagram for the sake of convenience. We should think of it rather as an act by which a light by its nature makes something manifest. Now, within the proximate light is formed a luminous accident, what Sudhavati refers to as the propitious light, a light which then illuminates another incorporeal light. So the proximate light passes on this propitious light, which causes the proximate light to become the emanatory principle from which another incorporeal light overflows. This process then continues in a series of emanations overflowing from the light of lights. What we can see here is a descending relationship between the emanative principle and its act. And as we refer to this emanative relation, it's important to keep in mind that we're not speaking of a straightforward causal relation. The emanative principle doesn't precede its act materially or temporally. All of this takes place outside the realm of contingency and generation. Instead, we should understand each of these emanative acts as an overflow from the light above it, an act of luminescence, of intrinsic awareness whose reflective nature gives rise to another. We can see here that B is an overflow from A and that C is an overflow from B. So both B and C are imminent effects of A. Each emanative light is not only possible because of the principle upon which it depends, it would be nothing without it, but each light is also simultaneously a necessary being because nothing but it can flow out from its principle. Thus, throughout the emanatory hierarchy, there's continuity, just as there is a continuity between the sun and its rays, but also a complete dependency of members lower in the hierarchy upon the principle from which they emanate. In the world of pure light, all the lights shine upon and behold each other, and as Sulavardi puts it, there is no veil between them. As we'll see in just a moment, the entire cosmos flows out from the emanatory acts of the incorporeal lights. Now, the hierarchy of incorporeal light, as so far described, is functionally equivalent to Ibn Sina's emanatory schema, where the immaterial lights are conceived of as intellects, incorporeal intelligences perceiving and cognizing their own existence, along with the rest of the intellects in the hierarchy of light. And recall, this is precisely how Sudhavardi conceives of pure light, as light in and of itself, self-luminous, aware of its own nature as well as the nature of those things that it lights upon. 
In being aware of their own essence, the incorporealites necessarily also become aware of their dependence upon their emanatory principle, the light above them in ontological rank. For Sudhavadi, this establishes relations of dominance and love between all members of the hierarchy. Members of higher ontological rank exert dominance over the lower members, while lower members desire and love the lights above them. Sudhavadi writes, thus all existence is ordered on the basis of love and dominance. For example, the proximate light is aware of its own essence, and in this awareness it becomes aware of its dependence upon the light of lights, for which it now yearns. But something further happens in this act of self-cognizance. In its intellection of its own dependence on the light of lights, a shadow is formed within it and it darkens itself. That is, a dark aspect is formed within it, which now causes the proximate light to cast a shadow, which brings into being the first corporeal barrier, what Sudhavardi refers to as the Great Barrier, which he seems to conceive of as the container or vessel of the universe itself. Now we can see that while each light begets another light, it at the same time begets a shadow, which gives rise to a barrier, and this process continues for the other lights down through the series of emanations. Let's call the light that emanates from the proximate light incorporeal light one. Incorporeal light one is now in much the same position to the proximate light as the proximate light is to the light of lights. A propitious light is formed in incorporeal light one in receiving illumination from the proximate light, which enables incorporeal light one to itself become an emanative principle, engendering incorporeal light two. At the same time, incorporeal light one is aware of its own dependence upon its emanative principle, generating within it a dark aspect, which then casts a shadow, giving rise to another barrier, in this case, the sphere of the fixed stars. Now the process repeats for incorporeal light two. In receiving the propitious light from the light above, it becomes an emanatory principle, while in the awareness of its own dependence, a dark aspect is formed within it, giving rise to another celestial barrier, this time to the sphere of Saturn. This process then continues until all the planetary spheres are engendered, the sphere of Jupiter, of Mars, of the Sun, of Venus, of Mercury, and of the Moon. One of Sudhavati's major innovations to this Ibn Sinian emanationist cosmology is in noticing that ten immaterial intellects is not sufficient to account for the array and diversity of light we see in the night sky. The night sky is filled with stars, and if it is the immaterial lights that bring those bodies into being, those immaterial lights must be just as numerous as the stars in the night sky. Since the fixed stars are innumerable, although not infinite, so must be the immaterial lights that are the cause of them. Sudhavardi writes, The incorporeal lights, free of connections with barriers, are more in number than 10, or 20, or 100, or 200, or 1,000, or 100,000. The result is a complex network of interacting rays and aspects amongst the immaterial lights, their constellating factors dimly reflected in the constellations we see in the darkness of the night sky. So far, Sudhavardi has given us an emanationist account of the creation of the visible heavens. Now, at the lowest level of this vertical hierarchy of lights, in the sphere of the active intellect, the sphere of the moon, emanates the lights that correspond to human souls, We'll have more to say about how these souls incarnate in just a moment, but before we do, in order to round off the elements of the immaterial world of pure light, we need to discuss the horizontal dimension of lights. Because Sudhavardi holds that from this vertical hierarchy arises a horizontal dimension, what Sudhavardi refers to as the masters of species, or alternatively as theurgies. These are equivalent to the platonic forms, the archetypes of earthly species species, whose individual instances are the particular entities we encounter in the material world. Those individual instances Suavardi refers to as talismans. Thus, we find an archetype of each of the elements, an archetype of water, and of fire, and of earth. Likewise, we find the archetype of all minerals, of plants, of animals, and of course of human beings. Each of these archetypes is materially instantiated in an individual instance of it. 
So this particular instance of water, or this particular plant, or this particular person, each is a talisman whose individual character is determined by its archetype and the quality of the rays and aspects from the world of pure lights that passes through those archetypes down into the sublunar sphere. The arrangement of everything that we see, from the mineral kingdom up through the plants and animals, to human beings, to the planets and the stars beyond are, quote, not haphazard. It is the shadow of some intelligible order, an order that is, quote, beyond the knowledge of any man. The wonders of the ethereal world, the relations among the spheres, their precise and certain enumeration, all these are very difficult, and there's nothing to prevent there being other wonders imperceptible to us in and beyond the fixed stars. The immaterial world of light rains down its influence through the stars, planets, plants, animals, beckoning those receptive to the light back to knowledge of their station within the hierarchy of immaterial light. For Sudavardi, then, there are four worlds. The world of immaterial lights, the world of autonomous images that mediates between the incorporeal and corporeal worlds, which again we'll discuss a bit later, the world of the celestial spheres, and the corporeal world of concrete matter. I think that it's reasonable to speculate that Sudavadi's cosmology also provides a framework for understanding the esoteric sciences of, for example, astrology, magic, and theurgy. It's not surprising, for instance, that we find in Sudavadi's writings prayers and invocations to the planetary intelligences, to the lights or angels that rule over the planets themselves. Here, for instance, is a prayer to the planetary intelligence of the sun, Hurakesh. God hath made the supreme luminary a sovereign instrument, and hath cast his light upon him. He hath brought unto him the sovereignty of the corporeal domains, and made him master of those who are in bodies. By him hath he made clear the proof to all worlds. He hath made him the means of order, the perfecter of life, the cause of seasons of night and day. The holy soul seek to converse with him, saying, O thou most luminous person, whose face is ever to his father, beseech the giver of mind and death and life, and say, exalt the remembrance of light. Aid the people of light, and guide the light unto the light. And not only do we find prayers and invocations, we also find at least a theoretical justification for the use of Materia Magica. The pure light of the incorporeal world rains down through the spheres and archetypes into the world of corporeal darkness and shadow. All things in the material world then correspond to some aspect or relation of light in the incorporeal world. Thus, certain objects, along with certain prayers, can invoke that light, which inheres in the cosmos, and aid the soul in its ascent back to the realm of pure incorporeal light. The sublunar world, the earthly world we inhabit, contains the traces and fragments of light from the world of pure light illuminations that remind us of our origin and home and beckon us toward it. In fact, since all beings are under the influence of dominance and love, everything desires to return to its origin. All created beings then, in their turn, desire to return to the world of light, and it is the task of the mystic to make such a journey. I think at this point it's appropriate here to quote Rumi's poem, I died as a mineral. I died as a mineral and became a plant. I died as plant and rose to animal. I died as animal and I was man. Why should I fear? When was I less by dying? Yet once more I shall die as man, to soar with angels blessed. But even from angelhood I must pass on, all except God doth perish. When I have sacrificed my angel's soul, I shall become what no mind e'er conceived. Oh, let me not exist, for non-existence proclaims in organ tones, to him we shall return. And Sudavardi's ontology is also an angelology. The incorporeal intelligences are conceived as archangels and angels. As we've seen, Bauman in Zoroastrian angelology is the first of the archangels created by Ahura Mazda. Bauman then brings into being the archangels below, and thus a hierarchy of angels is begotten. 
Since the fixed stars and celestial barriers come into being from this vertical hierarchy of angels, the stars and the planets have angelic intelligences that rule over them. As Nasser writes, the visible heavens are thus a materialization of angelic substances. And these angels are not just out there moving the planets around, they are to be encountered inwardly in the mystic's ascent back to the world of light. Each angelic order performs an ontological task which, quote, gradually helps the Salik to find his spiritual abode by providing him with spiritual topography of the sacred world and its many paths and pitfalls. And from this vertical order of archangelic intelligences and souls springs the horizontal order of platonic archetypes, the masters of species, each of which also has an angel that presides over it. To each form corresponds an angel, and thus every member of a species has an angel that rules over it and guards it. The Lord of Fire, for instance, Sudavadi names as Ori Behesht, and the Lord of Earth as Fandamod. These are living spiritual entities illuminating the talismans, the dusky substances in which they inhere. And of course, there is the species Homo sapiens, the human being, which also has its lord and archangelic ruler. In this case, the ruler is the archangel Gabriel, the angel of knowledge and revelation, who is associated with the active intellect. The human soul is a lordly light that will eventually pass through the archetype of humanity and incarnate as an individual person. Now, every barrier is a condensation of interactions of rays and aspects that has been cast as a shadow from the world of light. Thus, the dusky substances have their own particular quality and character depending upon the rays and aspects from which they are derived. This character of the dusky substances or fortresses makes it a suitable talisman for a particular influx of immaterial light as a suitable vehicle for one of the souls from the immaterial world. As we move down the hierarchy of immaterial lights, more and more accidents accrue to the lights lower in rank, so that by the time we reach the managing or controlling lights, human souls, we find them bombarded by a diversity of rays and influences. Some of these rays overlap in such a way so as to give rise to a density in the soul, a dark aspect, and this dark aspect is then attracted to some dusky substance, what Suavadi refers to as a fortress, a human body, which is influenced by a similar set of rays and aspects and thus resonates with it. Thus, a mutual desire and recognition is developed between the soul and the fortress to which it is attracted. The fortress desires its heavenly counterpart and in so doing invokes the commanding light with whom it has a friendship, calling that soul down into the sublunar world. Likewise, the soul itself is attracted to the body that invokes it, each resonating in mutual sympathy. The soul then incarnates in the fortress, which, quote, is the locus in which its acts are made evident, the pouch for its lights, the container for its effects, the encampment of its faculties. However, it's not the case that the managing light leaves its station in the world of immaterial light. Rather, the managing light divides in half, with half remaining in the angelic world and the other incarnating. The half that remains in the world of light functions as the angel of that person, their spiritual guide that the incarnated human now seeks to reunite with. This is the light to which he is continually attracted, the light of his angel, which is really the light that he is himself. It is the angel who, dominating over the form of the individual, provides the motive of love that causes the individual to desire to return to their true home and origin in the world of light. As Henry Corbon has pointed out, the concept of the guardian angel is identical to that of the hermetic perfect nature, the individual guide, the suprasensory personal master, who, when entered into relation with, constitutes a dialogical unity, and, quote, unus ambo, in which each of the two simultaneously assumes the position of the I and the self, image and mirror. My image looks at me with my own look. I look at it with its own look. This concept of the perfect nature will again become relevant in Sudavardi's epistemological doctrine, Knowledge by Presence, in that the act of knowing is simultaneously the reality of perfect nature itself. Here is an invocation to perfect nature that Sudavardi gives. O thou chief master and holy king, 
precious spiritual being. Thou art the spiritual father and mystic son entrusted by the leave of God with the care of my person. He who prays devoutly to God, great is the bounty of the God of gods for the rectification of my deficiencies. Thou art clothed in the most splendid of the divine lights and standest in the loftiest degree of perfection. I beseech thee by that one who granted thee this mighty longing and bestowed upon thee this corporeal emanation to reveal thyself to me in the best of manifestations, to show me the brilliant light of thy face, and to mediate for me before the God of gods by the emanation of the light of mysteries, to lift from my heart the shadows of the veils by the right that he hath upon thee and his station before thee. This invocation is accompanied with these instructions. If you wish him to appear before you, shun the meat of animals, cast off attachments, devote yourself to Salat, and purify your clothes. It is he who gives success and aid. This self, of course, is a pure incorporeal light, divided so that it can reunite with itself and attain wisdom and perfection. And it's through knowledge of oneself, of one's perfect nature, that one also comes to know God, because as a pure emanative light, the self is absorbed in that light from which it emanates and is purely dependent upon that light, the light of lights. To gain knowledge of oneself is to gain knowledge of this dependence, and to gain knowledge of this dependence is to come to know God. It is to be reabsorbed back into the light from which one came in an act of mystic annihilation. So, in summary, the universe that we inhabit for Sudavardi is a shadow cast by the immaterial world of pure light. But that light shines through into the darkness, illuminating it, like a lamp lighting upon the darkened corners of a room. Every natural body, every impulse and secretive yearning is a veil that hides the empirical ego from the world of light, but also an invocation of that light, a talismanic enchantment that has the potential to lead the soul back to its origin and home. Through spiritual practice and purification, the philosopher sage encounters the reality of light directly in a face-to-face -face encounter with the divine, and it is just such a state of direct presence, of unveiling, that will serve as the basis of Sudavardi's epistemology, which we turn to now. At this point, we should be able to appreciate the uniqueness of the Ishraqi doctrine, a doctrine that ran contrary to the peripateticism of the age. Not only does the Illuminationist philosophy offer its own compelling ontology, cosmology, and angelology, bringing together discursive reasoning with direct intuitive insight, this distinct mode of philosophical thought is also grounded in an epistemology based in light, an epistemological doctrine known as knowledge by presence. We have seen that in opposing the reality of the essence-existence distinction, Sudavardi was able to assert his doctrine of mystic light, a hierarchical and emanatory schema in which reality is constituted by degrees and intensities of light. What Sudavardi has done is made use of the peripatetic machinery, its modes of reasoning and analysis to undermine it from within. He uses the conceptual tools of the peripatetics to go beyond them. In asserting the ultimate nature of reality as light, a reality that is self-evident and in no need of definition or further explanation, Sudavardi grounds philosophical speculation and analysis in a direct mystical experience of light. In the absence of such a revelatory experience, philosophy is merely an empty shell, the corpse of a living doctrine that can only be truly encountered when philosophical analysis is wedded to intuitive and mystical insight. Just as Sudavardi ends up taking ontology out of the hands of the peripatetics by grounding it in an experience of light, so too does he liberate epistemology from its purely conceptual modes by grounding it in a direct form of experiential knowledge that he calls knowledge by presence. To accomplish this task, Sudavardi begins by attacking the Aristotelian notion of essential definition. Aristotle had established the idea that through essence specifying definitions we can come to know genuinely necessary features of reality. The idea is that in order to truly have knowledge of something, we cannot merely identify its transient or accidental features. We need to identify some feature of the thing that all and only things of that kind have in common. Definition is to disclose the essence of a thing discursively, crystallizing its essence in a formulable statement which can then serve as the basis for further scientific investigation. 
Take for example the classical definition, man is a rational animal. This definition of man was taken classically to state the essence of what it is to be a human person. It does this by wedding together genus and differentia. The genus in this case is the genus animal, that part of the definition which is also predicable of things of different sorts, such that while it factors into the definition of man, it is also predicable of things more generally. The differentia, though, is the essence specifying component of the definition, that aspect of the definition which is capable of distinguishing between different members of the genus. So classically, being rational is the essence specifying characteristic of being human. Such a definition in capturing the essence of the thing defined has the further virtue of being able to explain other features found across things of that type, such as a human person's capacity for language use. Of course, anything we do define in this way will still have accidental or non-essential characteristics, features that are contingent to the thing defined, but which still factor into its identity. It would be true, for instance, to state that man is a featherless biped, even though being featherless and being bipedal are not essential characteristics of the human person. Now, it is important to note that in attacking essential definition, Sudhavardi is not denying that definition plays an important role in philosophical analysis and scientific inquiry. What he does deny, however, is that definition can provide us with certain knowledge of the thing defined. Certainty for Sudhavardi is a matter of direct experiential knowing and will always elude the conceptual devices we use to try to capture it. Definitions can help us formulate conceptually what has been revealed to us directly in experience, but on their own they lack the ability to confer certain knowledge upon us. To undermine the notion that essential definition can on its own provide us with certain knowledge, Sudhavadi advances several different lines of attack. The first is that a thing's definition not only consists of its essential features and properties, as we were just discussing, but also its concomitant or accidental features that go into making that thing the unique thing that it is. Man is a rational animal, but he's also a featherless biped, and also many other things. So Sudhavati's idea here is that in order to truly know what something is, we have to know all of its accidental and concomitant properties, along with all the essential ones. But this just isn't possible. Such a definition can't be formulated. Therefore, any definition given of a thing will always remain incomplete. A related argument suggests that while we may think that we know the essential property of a thing, its true nature may still elude us. We may be overlooking some further essential feature of the thing. How do we know for sure that we've included all of the thing's differentia in the definition? It might be that we've overlooked something, left something out. This leaves open the possibility that our definition is incomplete. Another line of attack that Suavardi takes is that if a definition is successful in the mind of the hearer, that will be because that person already knows the definition. And conversely, if one doesn't already know the definition, then the definition won't be persuasive or informative. Take, for example, the definition of a father as the possessor of a son. If one understands this definition, it will be because one understands what it means to be the possessor of a son. And if one understands that, then one already knows what it means to be a father. Conversely, if one does not understand what it means to be the possessor of a son, then one still wouldn't understand what it means to be a father, even though they were given the definition. The definition works only if we already know the definition, and it fails if we don't. So if we know the thing, we don't need the definition, and if we don't know the thing, the definition won't do us any good. Another interesting skeptical argument about the possibility of achieving certain knowledge through essential definition is that while it's conceivable to define a thing when the genus and differentia are different, if genus and differentia are the same, definition is impossible. So take for instance the definition of man as a rational animal. Not admitting the difficulties we already discussed, the definition works because being rational and being animal are not one and the same. But what about when we try to define something like a color? Take for instance the color blue. How do we define it? Maybe we just point at the thing and say, that's blue, or exasperatedly utter the expression, blue is blue. Sudhavardi's point is that we can't define a color in the way we can define other things because color cannot be defined by something other than itself. 
it's simple and in no need of definition. Experience of it is enough. He writes, the truth is that blackness is one simple thing. It can be intellected and has no unknown part. It cannot be defined as it is to someone who has not beheld it, but anyone who has beheld it has no need of definition. Its form in the mind is like its form in sensation. Such things have no definitions. Sudavadi is suggesting that our experience of color confers immediate and direct knowledge of that color. It's basic and axiomatic, not requiring any further definition. As we'll see, however, it's not sensory perception itself that confers this knowledge. Sudavardi, in fact, argues that sensory experience alone cannot yield this kind of certain knowledge, but rather sensory experience that's grounded in knowledge by presence, to which we turn now. In his book of elucidations, Sudavardi recounts a visionary episode in which the figure of Aristotle appears to him and discusses with him a solution to the problem of knowledge that he had been struggling with. The visionary being who Sudavardi identifies as Aristotle does this by leading him to the conception of knowledge by presence. Here is an excerpted portion from that text translated by Henry Corban. A narrative and a dream. For some time I was prey to an intense obsession. I ceaselessly practiced meditation and spiritual exercises since the problem of knowledge assailed me with insoluble difficulties. What they say about it in books brought me no light. On one particular night, I experienced a dreamlike ecstasy. Suddenly I was wrapped in gentleness. There was a blinding flash, then a very diaphanous light in the likeness of a human being. I watched attentively and there he was, helper of souls, imam of wisdom, primus magister, whose form filled me with wonder and whose shining beauty dazzled me. He came toward me, greeted me so kindly that my bewilderment faded and my alarm gave way to a feeling of familiarity. And then I began to complain to him of the trouble I had with this problem of knowledge. Come back, awaken to yourself, he said to me, and your problem will be solved. How so, I asked. Is the knowledge which you have of yourself a direct perception of yourself by yourself, or do you get it from something else? The text goes on, but what is revealed to Sudavardi in this visionary encounter is that the problem of knowledge is ultimately a problem of self-knowledge, and that in solving that problem, all other epistemological problems will be resolved. When Aristotle asks, is the knowledge you have of yourself a direct perception of yourself by yourself, or do you get it from something else, he's asking whether when one introspectively becomes aware of their own awareness, whether this awareness is a representation mediated by a concept or an image, or whether it's a direct and unmediated perception of the self itself. As Sudavardi comes to realize, if it were a conceptually mediated representation, it would embroil him in a tangle of contradictions. We'll examine these arguments in just a moment. For Sudavardi, awareness of oneself has to be direct and unmediated. The self and awareness itself are existentially one and the same. Here is an outline of the big picture view Sudavardi is developing here. There is nothing more evident than light itself. Light is immediately known by whomever encounters it. It requires no definition or explanation. It is axiomatic and self-evident. The self is immediately and directly known in introspection. There's nothing more evident than oneself. Therefore, the self is light, and self-knowledge is identical with the ontological reality of light. This is knowledge by presence. The self is a presence or light that is identical to reality itself. To know oneself is to know one's Lord. Here's the general idea. When I assert that I know that P, where P just stands for some simple proposition, the assertion seems to implicitly entail that not only do I know that P, but that I also know that I know that P. That is, that I have knowledge of myself as the knower of P. If that is the case, then self-knowledge must be bound up in any act of knowing. If I know that P is to have any meaning at all, it must entail that I have knowledge of myself, because if the self were not known to the self in the act of such an utterance, then something like its contradiction would be entailed. For instance, it's not the case that I know that P. Maybe somebody else has knowledge that P, but it certainly isn't me. 
So in order for me to have any knowledge at all, I must first possess self-knowledge. Now, the question that arises for Sudhavardi is, do I know myself directly or by means of a representation? Because if I know myself through a representation, certain intractable problems will arise. Under a representational theory of knowledge, an I-it relation is a constitutive feature of any act of knowing. That is, it preserves a subject-predicate relationship where the I, the subject of knowledge, must be separate and distinct from the it, the object of knowledge. And this structural feature of knowledge holds in most ordinary cases. But the representational theory of knowledge begins to break down according to Sudhavardi when applied to self-knowledge. Here's the issue. If I know myself through a representation, that representation becomes the object of my thought, an it. And in becoming an it, it becomes a not I. And if the representation is a not I, then it can't be me, in which case I don't have knowledge of myself. In fact, on such a theory, it looks like self-knowledge is impossible. But Sudhavardi thinks this consequence is absurd because we do have self-knowledge. So maybe we can hold on to this knowledge by asserting that in cases of self-knowledge, the I and the it only appear separate and distinct, but are in fact one and the same. But as we saw, the I-it relation is essential for all representational knowing. So it looks like the representational theory of knowledge, when applied to knowledge of the self, leads to the contradiction that the subject and object of knowledge are simultaneously identical and different. Surely, Sudhavadi reasons, something must have gone wrong. Sudhavadi's solution is to claim that self-knowledge is non-representational. In knowing myself, I know myself directly, not through a representation or the mediation of concepts. Rather, I know myself as a pure presence, as a light that is revealed to itself through its own luminosity. Another argument that Suravardi advances to establish that the self is known non-representationally is by making a distinction between an attribute and that to which attributes are applied. If self-knowledge is representational, then one must know that some given representation is a representation of the self, and then assimilate that representation to themselves in the act of self-knowing. This would amount to knowing oneself through something added or assimilated to the self. The it would be added to the I, and we could then conceive of that addition as an attribute of the self. However, the only way an attribute could be attributed to the self in the act of knowing is if one already had pre-knowledge of oneself. If one didn't already know themselves, then they wouldn't be able to know whether this attribute was an attribute of themselves or of somebody else, for instance. So Sudhavardi's conclusion then is that we must know ourselves by presence. We are never absent or unconscious of ourselves. There's no gap between me and myself. Our self is more evident to us than anything else. And as we've seen, that than which nothing is more evident is light. So the self for Sudhavardi is pure incorporeal light. Now recall that Sudhavardi thinks this conception of knowledge by presence can account for all other kinds of knowledge, such as knowledge of one's own physical body, of one's sensations and feelings, of external objects, and even of immaterial or intelligible objects. Knowledge by presence is a primordial mode of knowing in which all other forms of knowing are grounded. To see this, let us return to the expression, I know that P. At face value, the expression consists of three terms, the subject, the object, and the knowing relation that holds between the two. As we've already pointed out, the expression entails a non-representational knowledge of the self for Sudhavardi, knowledge by presence. We now need to see how this knowledge by presence grounds knowledge that P. The first step is to understand what it means for the self to be a field of presence. A helpful analogy here is that of a lamp whose light shines upon and illumines the objects in a darkened room. Likewise, the first personal field of presence of any self-conscious being is a light that illumines any object that comes within its sphere. The I in I know that P is this first personal field of presence. When an object, whether internal like a pain or external like a tree, enters this sphere of presence, it's given to us directly and without mediation in our experience of it. 
If we reflect upon the phenomenology of any perceptual episode, for instance, we'll find that subject and object are given to us in experience all at once, as a unitary simplex. This isn't a strict numerical identity between subject and object, though. Rather, it's a unitary relation. In the act of perception, self and object are given all at once as a unity of consciousness, and this is because the object itself has ingressed into the sphere of the self. The self now shines its rays upon it, illuminating it, embracing it within its fold. The object is unveiled in the light of the self, and this unveiling closes the distinction between self and object. All of us in our experience of the world are at the ground level experiencing this knowledge by presence. In seeing a beautiful sunset, listening to an exquisite piece of music, or feeling an acute pain, we are entering into direct contact with the object of experience itself. Such an experience on its own, of course, is entirely inscrutable to anyone other than the one who experiences it, incapable of being defined or directly communicated. The only access we have to this knowledge is through our direct experience, or as the Sufis say, through dalq, direct experiential tasting. Here, truth and falsity in their ordinary sense, as in the truth or falsity of a proposition, doesn't apply because we haven't yet reached the level at which concepts are applicable. Instead, what we have is a direct encounter, an unveiling of the ontological reality of the object itself. Let's again return to the expression, I know that P. How could such an expression ever be meaningful if knowledge is inscrutable and beyond the scope of discursive reasoning? Let's turn our attention to the object of knowledge, knowledge that P. As the object enters the sphere of presence of the self, self and object coalesce into a unitary simplex. But the self, through its rational powers, is capable of reflecting upon this unitary simplex, that is, of forming a concept of it. It pops up a level where conceptual analysis of the experience becomes possible. Concepts and representations are then extracted from this non-conceptual ground. Once concepts and representations come into play, we enter the language game of truth and falsity of giving and asking for reasons. We can now ask a question like, it seems to me that I saw such and such, but I wonder if I really did. This is the level at which the expression, I know that P takes on its usual meaning. And even uh, propositional knowledge is a kind of knowledge by presence in that any conceptual act must still take place within the sphere of the self. Its presence is what illumines its own experiential ground, as well as the concepts and representations that are then employed to talk about it. While such explicit knowledge claims are further removed from, let's say, the core of the self operating at a more remote level of cognition, every cognitive act must occur within the self's field of presence. Thus, we find in Suravardi a hierarchical stratification of knowledge. The very base we find pure presence, equating to the ontological reality of light and thus to God. For here enters knowledge of the body and its sensations, and then we move on to knowledge of external objects. From here, we move to knowledge of intelligible objects, lights in the world of immaterial light, which then brings us again right back to the base of knowledge by presence. The highest and the lowest, or that which is closest and that which is most remote, are here united. Of course, uh, attaining to that kind of realization is the task that the philosopher sage is devoted to, who through purification and spiritual practice makes the journey from the lowest to the highest and back again in order to be the voice and vicegerent of God upon the earth. Knowledge by presence is ultimately a form of mystical knowing that lies at the basis of all other modes of cognition. A knowledge that is simultaneously the ontological reality of light itself. But this knowledge is hard won. The entire life of the philosopher sage must be sacrificed at the altar of spiritual devotion. The journey back to the origin and source of all things is long and arduous with many dangers and pitfalls, and it's here that the practical demands of the mystic life make themselves felt. Recall that the soul is not purely abstracted from the physical body. While part of the soul remains in the world of immaterial lights, as the guardian angel or perfect nature of the initiate, the other part is drawn to a body, to the world, to which it descends and incarnates. Thus, the soul straddles both the immaterial world of light and the sensory world of physical manifestation. 
In this way, the soul is the microcosmic counterpart of the mundus imaginalis, the world of suspended images, which mediates between the intelligible and sensible worlds. In fact, it is here in the mundus imaginalis, which is neither corporeal nor incorporeal, where the visionary and mystical experiences of the sages, prophets, and initiates transpire. As the mystic begins their pilgrimage back to their origin and home, it will be the theophonic events of the mundus imaginalis which will illumine and energize the soul, enabling it to detach from the physical body and ascend through the cosmic spheres beyond the border of Mount Kof, ultimately to be fully reabsorbed back into the world of pure light. In order to understand the situation the incarnated soul finds itself in, we need to understand the conditions of the body with its psychological and instinctual faculties, for incarnation is at once an opportunity for the soul to individuate and acquire wisdom, but at the same time can also be a snare that can trap the soul in the sublunar world, causing it to fall into a state of forgetfulness of its true origin and home. To overcome this forgetfulness and ignorance, aesthetic practices must be undertaken, such as fasting, reduction in sleep, invocation and prayer, devotion to a spiritual master, the cultivation of moral virtues, etc., which will enable the initiate to gain control over and ultimately disengage the senses and the physical body, overcoming the physical and psychological fetters of darkness that keep the soul trapped in matter. It will be through knowledge by presence that the body and its faculties will be illumined, allowing them to become fit vehicles for the lordly light that has incarnated within it. As we've seen, it is from the vertical hierarchy of lights, the class of lights that Suravarti refers to as the dominating lights, commanding lights, or managing lights that the soul is ascribed. The commanding light is then able to manage the body to which it is wedded via a subtle translucent substance called spirit which receives the propitious light sent down through the angelic hierarchies, illuminating the darkness within the physical body. Through the light of spirit, the faculties inherent in the body are illumined, enabling the commanding light to take control over them. The faculties of the soul become the vehicle by which the commanding light can then express itself. That being the case, it will be useful to quickly canvas what these faculties are and the role they play in the overall constitution of the organism. We'll begin with the vegetative and animal faculties, the schema of which Suravardi inherits directly from Ibn Sina. Of the vegetative faculty, there are primarily three, although each can be broken down into further supporting functions. First is the nutritive faculty, which obtains nutrients from food. Second is the augmentive faculty, which supervises the growth of the various parts of the organism. And third is the generative faculty, which is responsible for reproduction and the continuation of the species. Upon these three basic faculties are based the sensory and motor faculties, which distinguish all animals from plants. First is the concupiscible faculty, which stimulates motion toward that which is necessary and or beneficial to the organism. The concupiscal faculty is a faculty of desire, even of love, in that it motivates the organism to seek what is pleasurable. The second is the irascible faculty, which stimulates motion away from what is harmful or destructive. It is thus equivalent to the passions of hatred or anger, and is the primary motive in the quest for domination. These two animal faculties are crucial for the budding mystic to gain control over, as can be seen by the central focus Sudavadi places on love and dominance at all ontological levels. To gain control over the animal instincts is the primary way in which the mystic gains control over the body and mind. Distinguishing the human soul from both the animal and vegetative faculties are the familiar five external senses, sight, hearing, taste, smell, and touch. Sudavardi, however, reduces these five senses to one sense, the sensus communis, the immediate recipient and integrator of the sensory perceptions of the external senses. It is itself a unity and combines within itself all sensibles, perceiving them simultaneously. Now, corresponding to the five external senses are five internal senses. First is the imagination, which retains the forms of the impressions acquired through the sensus communis. Second is the imaginative faculty, which synthesizes those forms 
stored in the imagination and which operates at the level of both perceptual and intelligible objects. Third is the estimative faculty, which gives coherence to the operations of the imaginative faculty by extracting the meanings of the forms within the imagination. If one perceives a tire, for instance, the form of that object will be stored in the imagination, which the imaginative faculty then organizes into a representation and which is then judged in terms of its intrinsic meaning, for example, as something to run away from. Sudhavardi argues that these three faculties are really one. The next of the internal senses is memory, which retains the meanings generated by the estimative and imaginative faculty. Memories, curiously enough for Sudhavardi, are not stored anywhere in the faculties or in the brain. Rather, they are retained in an autonomous realm of memory, which seems to be located amongst the celestial spheres. Finally, the fifth faculty is the faculty of the rational soul itself, the commanding light whose presence illumines all other faculties, subsuming them into itself. Sudhavardi writes, Just as all the senses reduce to a single sense, the common sense, so too all of the faculties reduce to a single faculty in the managing light, its luminous essence emanating by essence. He further adds to this, the commanding light encompasses and judges that it has a particular faculty. It has this judgment by its essence and is thus the sense of the senses. That which is dispersed throughout the body returns finally in the commanding light to a single thing. The commanding light shines upon the images of the imagination and the like and it shines upon the vision without need of a form. Now, a part of the problem here for the neophyte or the initiate is that the faculties of the body, both internal and external, do not always respond to the commands of the managing light. We've all had the experience, for instance, of resolving to do something and then feeling a kind of inner resistance to following through with what we had set our minds to. The body and its faculties draw us to the physical, to the sensual, but the commanding light draws us to the immaterial and intelligible. As such, conflict between soul and body can result. It's through aesthetic practice and spiritual discipline that this inner resistance is overcome, lifting the veils that obscure the initiate soul from himself. Once the body and the senses are subdued, the soul can be freed to leave the body and reunite with its spiritual counterpart in the world of light. It's through aesthetic practice and spiritual discipline that the soul is able to at least temporarily liberate itself from the bondage of the body and attain to a vision of the celestial lights. And this begs the question as to where such visionary encounters take place. For Sudhavardi, just as there is an autonomous world of memory existing independently of the particular faculty that remembers, so too is there an autonomous world of images, a world that is traveled to by the initiate, mystic, or prophet when they are abstracted from their bodies. The visionary events undergone on the plane of the Mundus Imaginalis are real events. In fact, they are more real than the events that take place in the sensory world because they are more directly energized by their proximity to the world of immaterial light. Suspended images, however, are not bodies in that they have no direct spatio-temporal existence in the sensory world, but they are also not purely incorporeal entities. Rather, they are like images suspended in a mirror. Sudhavardi writes, the mirror is the locus in which the form in the mirror is made evident. The forms are suspended and are in neither a place nor a locus. The imaginative faculty is the locus in which the forms of the imagination are made evident and are suspended. So while autonomous images are suspended in the mirror of the imagination, they can also become manifest in bodies due to the fact that the visionary topography of the Mundus Imaginalis symbolizes with the topography of our geographical maps. The Mundus Imaginalis is a liminal matrix of correspondences linking it with both the intelligible world of lights and the world of sensory matter. As such, it serves as a communication channel between the higher ontological light and the world of matter. These images become the vehicle for higher intelligible entities, such as the archangels and managing souls, to communicate with incarnate beings. 
It's through the realm of image and vision that esoteric knowledge and revelation is transmitted. Sudavadi also seems to suggest that those who attain to such a station are themselves able to produce such autonomous images. He writes, The brethren of incorporeality have a special station in which they are able to bring into existence self-subsistent images in whatever form they desire. This is called the station of B. Whoever sees that station knows with certainty the existence of a world other than that of barriers. In it are self-subsistent images and managing angels, taking for themselves talismans and self-subsistent forms by which they speak and are made evident. Given that the idea of the world of autonomous images is one that first emerges clearly, as a philosophical device at least, in Suravardi, it must be the case that it played an important role in his overall philosophical and spiritual project. In this regard, it's interesting to note that beside the philosophical text, Suravardi also composed allegories, or as Henry Corbon conceives of them, recitals, that deal precisely with the type of visionary imagery and angelic intelligences that the Mundus Imaginalis is designed to account for. As Corban notes, these recitals are not mere allegories, stating in images what could otherwise be grasped in doctrinal terms. These are not mere devices for the philosophical novice who hasn't yet learned how to reason philosophically. They are rather compositions that recreate the event they imitate, that is, the autonomous images of the Mundus Imaginalis speak through them. One can't help but suspect that Sudavardi had attained that special station that allowed him to bring into existence self-subsistent images. That is, images that resonate at a higher ontological octave and which are capable of elevating the soul to the plane of existence from which they proceed. These are images that are imbued with the life and energy of another world. So, our best route into the Mundus Imaginalis, then, is through the visionary recitals, which depict in veiled symbolic form the journey the mystic will take in their cosmic ascent through the spheres, beyond the border of the Koth Mountain, whose twelve mountains symbolize the celestial spheres that surround the earth, and into the world of Hercalia, the world of the Mundus Imaginalis, where the events of the prophets unfold. But the mystic will not rest here. They will continue to travel even beyond the world of image into the world of pure immaterial light. And this journey out through the spheres is also simultaneously a journey inward to the self. As every part of the cosmos at the macrocosmic level symbolizes with some element in the microcosm, so too is the journey out of the cosmos a journey we take inwardly through the various parts of the self. We see, for instance, the symbolic depiction of the faculties described earlier in the treatise on the reality of love. It begins, let him head for the city forest. Here, the city represents the rational faculties, where the forest or wilderness is indicative of mystical absorption and leaving ratiocination behind. The text continues, arriving there, he will see a fire kindled and someone sitting cooking something over the fire. One person is fanning the flames while another awaits anxiously while it's being cooked. Another separates the lighter portion that boils up from that which remains at the bottom of the pot and distributes it to the inhabitants of the city. The fire here is the stomach, the cook, the nutritive faculty, and the fanner of flames, the digestion. We continue. A lion and a boar wait in the forest. The former is occupied day and night with killing and tearing apart, while the latter is busy pilfering, eating, drinking. Let the seeker loose a lasso from his saddle ring and cast it over their necks, bind them tightly and throw them down on the spot. Here we have the sensory and motor functions of the animal soul, hatred and the will to dominance, desire and the will to pleasure and to love. In no uncertain terms is the initiate counseled to gain control over them. Let him entrust the reins to his steed and cry out to it, and in one leap it will scale the nine barriers and stand before the gateway to the city of the soul. Immediately the old man will greet, embrace him, and summon him forward. There is a spring called the water of life, and he will be commanded to bathe himself in it. Having attained immortality, he will be taught the divine book. 
Here the nine barriers are an image of the celestial spheres that the soul in its flight from the body must pass through. And when reaching the city of the soul, the world of Malakut, the soul bursts into the realm of suspended images. He is greeted by the old man, the archangelic intelligence, Gabriel, representative of the active intellect, angel of knowledge and of revelation. The spring and water of life represents the origin, source, and home to which the soul has returned, reuniting with its immortal counterpart in the world of light. In bathing in the spring, the soul is equipped with revelatory knowledge from the divine book, the Quranic revelation that is written in the stars. Now, for Sudavadi, a symbol is not just a way of expressing a truth that could just as well be expressed in propositional terms. It is a way of communicating that which cannot be contained within ordinary linguistic formulations. As we've seen, the imaginative faculty operates not just at the level of sensory data received in ordinary empirical experience, but is also the medium through which the immaterial lights can be grasped and cognized. The mundus imaginalis is a vehicle through which disincarnate intelligences and objects can make themselves known to members of a lower ontological rank. As such, these symbols operate not just as pedagogical devices for the aspiring mystic. They are that, but they are also more. When meditated upon, their images lead the soul into an encounter with a higher ontological order of being. We know that these texts likely circulated amongst Suravardi's closest disciples, and one can't help but see a parallel here to the way in which the texts of the Corpus Hermeticum may have been read by its disciples, or the way in which Gnostic texts may have been circulated amongst a close-knit circle of initiates. In the treatise on the state of childhood, Suravardi depicts the process of being instructed in spiritual knowledge by an angelic intelligence. After encountering a group of children on their way to school, the protagonist inquires of them what kind of knowledge they are learning. He is instructed to ask their master. After setting out, he sees, quote, an old man standing in the wilderness. Now, the old man, or old men generally, represent angelic intelligences. And as we've seen, the wilderness represents that state of mystical absorption in which the mystic leaves behind ordinary cognitive processes. The treatise continues. I am their master, said the old man. You must instruct me in knowledge, I said. He brought a tablet, wrote the ABCs on it, and taught it to me. Let this suffice for today, he said. Tomorrow I will teach you something else. I will teach you a bit more every day until you have become a scholar. I went home and repeated the ABCs throughout the next day. The following day I went to him for another lesson. I mastered that one too. Then I began going to him 10 times a day and every time I learned something. Finally, there was never a time I was not with the old man and I acquired much knowledge. Here the young initiate is instructed by an angelic intelligence, is given a language in fact in which the knowledge that that angelic intelligence possesses can be transmitted. This language allows the initiate to communicate with the angel and over time this relationship is strengthened and made firm. This isn't straightforward. The imagery here and the narrative story guide us not in understanding some set of doctrines, but into an intuitive insight into how the relationship is established. We are being communicated to in a way that bypasses the discursive and rational intellect so that we can be instructed at the level of intuitive insight. In another striking image from the language of the ants is depicted the grail of the legendary Persian king Kaikusuru. Kaikusuru was in possession of the grail, the mirror of the universe. He contemplated everything that could be the object of his desire in this grail. There he was told of invisible worlds. There he investigated every realm of being. This grail was enclosed in a sheath of flesh, of a form that was individually fashioned every time and composed of ten joints. When Kai Kusru wanted to know some mystery of the invisible again, he handed the leather bag to the turning wheel once more to destroy it. When all bonds had been broken, the grail was no longer apparent. However, when all bonds had been established once again, the grail appeared once more because of the effect of the wheel. At the time of the spring equinox, Kaikusru exposed the grail and held it up against the sun. 
The brightness of the star hit the grail, and behold, all the lines and imprints of the worlds were seen in the manifest state. The grail here is enclosed in a sheath of flesh, the physical body, which is fashioned of ten joints. Recall the five external and five internal senses. When the joints are open, the senses are active, and the grail remains fixed to this turning wheel, the sphere of material existence. But when the joints are closed, that is, when sensory input is no longer allowed to interfere by providing it imperfect information about the world of gross materiality, then the grail appears in all its luminosity, and the mystic gazes into the mirror of the universe, beholding hidden worlds and every realm of being. Now, of course, the grail is not a material sensory object in any ordinary sense. It is an autonomous image, an intermediary of the world beyond, and in having access to this recital, we are also granted access to this intermediary plane. That is, of course, if we have the sense to know what it is we are looking at. At this point, we should have a good grasp on Sudavardi's overall project, and I hope to have communicated something of the magic of his view. I think that Sudavarti has something to offer us today, a vision of philosophy that has largely been forgotten and provides us with resources and tools to start doing philosophy in the illuminationist manner, even if we don't agree with Sudavarti on all the detailed points, because it is, after all, a philosophical project and philosophy is never done, wisdom is never finally closed off, but stretches out into the far future and the distant past, beckoning us to become who we really are. If you have any ideas about the works of other philosophers who you think are pursuing a project similar to Sudavardi, mention them in the comments below. Thinkers like Sudavardi are going to become the subject of future videos on this channel, and I'd love to hear what sorts of ideas his philosophy brings to mind for you. So thank you for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.